हैंडल लॉट वे एट वी वी सेशन इन द पास्ट अब जहां तक इस सेशन का सवाल है आई थिंक आई हैव बीन टोल्ड कि आप तो जीएसटी में भी घुस जाते हो इनकम टैक्स में भी घुस जाते हो आता आपको कुछ नहीं है तो ऐसा नॉन टैक्स टाइप का टॉपिक आपको दे देते हैं जिससे कोई आपका नॉलेज नहीं टेस्ट कर पाएगा सेकेंडली एक बहुत बड़ा हैजर्ड है वी हेट थ्री लेडीज इन दिस प्रीवियस सेशन दैट स्टार पार इज मिसिंग यर वी हैव वन यू हैव टू यू हैव टू यू हैव टू बैलेंस दैट विथ दिस Let's talk about this general topic, law of precedence. Law of precedence and law of precedence in tax, I think, is no different from law of precedence generally. ये है क्या है? Wherever there is an hierarchical system of courts, meaning that right from the assessing officer onwards, we have hierarchies defined. Assessing officer to the commissioner or the commissioner appeals. to the tribunal to the high court and to the supreme court hierarchical system ensures that each forum which is lower than the other follows the decisions of the higher court that's a general law of precedence in india which is known to be a common law country follow common law we follow also civil law in the sense and i just dwell because it's important to get to the source of this civil law jurisdictions largely in continental europe are basically jurisdictions which follow detailed codes in terms of statutory law common law jurisdictions other are slightly different and they really arise from england England itself follows a mix of civil law and common law now. So does US. So does India. In common law, general principles, equitable principles, are laid down by courts, and that also become a source of law. That is how law of precedence actually becomes a source of law. so we go beyond the statutory stated law and apply law laid down by courts which becomes as important if not more than just the statutory law hello now if you see what does the law precedent do it first of all explains statutory law it leads us in tax law if we talk about sometimes to purposive interpretations where the normal rule is strict interpretation even in strict interpretation sometimes there are question marks as to how do you interpret provisions that source again comes from precedential law where courts interpret provisions to say that if i were to apply this strictly this is the meaning next which is very important we have all heard the adage to say that tax and equity are strangers there is no equitable consideration in tax but there are principles of administrative law there are equitable considerations even in tax law which are often applied you give it give an example that supposing there is no hearing prescribed and we we all know cb gautam's case under section 269 you see that you are going to confiscate somebody's property and there is no hearing provided constitution bench of the supreme court said that will read in that natural justice provision even if it's not there we are looking at today we were speaking about faceless assessments etc and we are now becoming servants of the system we are forgetting that assessments appellate powers and the entire process is beyond a system so if you forget to tick a particular column on the system you lost your right to for a hearing you lost your fundamental right in some sense not fundamental in terms of constitution 
but a fundamental right to explain your case to the assessing officer. Courts are now coming to aid, and that is presidential law, to say that irrespective of whether you tick or not, your right is ensured. You can't have a situation where just because of a tick on the system, you lose your right. So this is the fundamental importance of presidential law. Other importance of presidential law is that while we talk about substantive change, substantive assessments, presidential law does become important, whether or not you'll be entitled to a deduction, whether or not you'll be entitled to an exemption, etc. For penal liabilities, it is extremely important. Because when there is discretion in penalties, you will have to establish that there was a particular basis for the tax treatment that you have given on your own. To establish reasonable cause, to establish that there are no malefides, presidential law becomes extremely important. These are the general importance of presidential law and why India as a country follows presidential law. One, it ensures judicial, it should ensure judicial discipline. Whether it does or not, I think all the practitioners here who work with assessing officers, who work with lower authorities, know that it should, but oftentimes it does not. That is a problem. Presidential law is meant to give certainty in law. People should know that this is how courts react to a particular provision and therefore this is the treatment that I ought to give. Oftentimes, it doesn't happen again. Presidential law is some kind of a reason why there should be no arbitrariness in departmental action. It's important. But we see depart <coughs> departmental action which is quite arbitrary oftentimes. That is why we exist. That is why all of us professionals exist. That department will do what it has to do and we will go to courts, knock on the doors of the courts and create more presidential law for others to follow. Presidential law is meant to provide certainty and prevent chaos in the administration of justice. The kind of powers, if you see the kind of powers that have been offered to assessing officers and to the department, whether it is searches, whether it is confiscation, whether, whether it is penal action, the powers with the department have been increasing decade after decade. Kail Goel Sahib is here, he's practiced, I think, probably prior to even when we were born. And with his experience, he can tell you, that the powers that the assessing officers are exercising today were certainly not the powers that existed at an earlier point in time. Look at GST today. In the last five or six years of GST, how many arrests have been made? We are talking about tax laws here. We are talking about collection of the right amount of tax by the government. Arrests were unknown in tax earlier. One or two instances that you know you would find in a case of smuggling or something in customs law, you would find. Thousands of arrests have been made in GST in the last five, six years of operation of GST. Of course, there are gross cases where we are talking about fake invoicing, stuff like that, where some stringent action is necessary. I don't know whether arrests are necessary or, and whether Bills can be refused. Ultimately, we are talking about personal liberties. But presidential law takes importance even in situations like this where the powers are increasing on one hand and the defense is getting reduced. You see the development of statutory law and you will see that the discretion available, even with courts, is reducing. Year by year, they are trying to define what is reasonable cause? What is technical? What is not technical? When will 
So the discretion is in, uh, reducing. Courts, of course, are equity based often times, and despite that reduction of discretion, can apply presidential law. Now, we want precedents to be applied. Sometimes we don't want precedents to be applied. And I can give you three straight examples. Three Supreme Court decisions in indirect tax law. First was where I think in some of these I've been a party. Fiat on valuation, where Supreme Court, it was very well settled. It was very well settled to say what that whether or not your transaction value is less than the cost of production, it makes no difference unless you find something wrong. Unless it's a transaction between related parties, there's no question of ignoring the transaction value, whether it's below or above the cost of production. Supreme Court in Fiat came out with a strange, strange, uh, you know, uh, decision saying that because the intent was of Fiat, to penetrate the market, that is additional consideration. Unheard of. Unheard of. We, in subsequent cases, the entire auto industry was hit first. We tried to argue otherwise. Of course, in that case, it doesn't happen very often. Statutory rule was amended in favor of the SSEs to say that even we can't agree with this decision. Second case, Nokia case from your court, yes. mobile, mobile chargers. To say that mobile charger is an accessory and not a part, therefore you can split the two and charge it to separate rates of tax. Unheard of. That if you have a combined pack, we went all around the high court filing rates where assessments were reopened. First success was to say that even on the basis of a Supreme Court judgment, you cannot do reassessment. This is when we want to avoid presidential law and get new law laid. Second success was we tried to explain to the judges that look at what the Supreme Court seems to have applied is composite goods principle. That whether or not this is comp, because that's what was argued, unfortunately. We raised an argument to say we are talking about not composite goods. We are talking about composite agreements. You buy a car, very laymanish kind of an example given to court, which was picked up like this, and this is the importance of presidential law, that the court can turn around a decision despite a Supreme Court decision. We said, buy a car, a music system is admittedly an accessory. It is not essential for the car. But if there is no option, while buying the car, it is fitted in every car. Then the question of getting into whether it's an accessory or a part does not arise at all. It is a composite contract and you cannot split the contract to charge to tax those that music system and the car and the steering wheel and the horn separately. It's a car, it has to be assessed as a car. Accepted like this by the court, despite the Supreme Court judgment. Ultimately now, we succeeded right up to the Supreme Court. Third, recent judgment of the Supreme Court in Northern Operating on secondments. All multinational companies are today affected by it. Supreme Court in Northern Operating in a particular set of facts said that if you get people from outside, it is manpower supply. And the entire salaries of those people will be considered as a consideration of as a consideration of a service contract, despite the fact that the Indian company which is employing these people temporarily is deducting TDS under section 192, treating them as employees, despite that. Now, in every case where people are coming from outside on temporary employment, it is being treated as Second, it's being treated as a service contract and past liabilities are being created. We've filed writs, writs have been entertained. Of course, the department itself has issued a circular that you have to see facts and circumstances. So, presidential law, again, from the SSE side also is important 
when it comes to making the assessing officer follow it. But it's also important to understand that sometimes precedent, presidential law is not favorable and there should be some ways or bylines in which we can go. There are certain, there are, in fact, my office is prepared and unfortunately we don't have a presentation here. Around 20 facets of presidential law, we can't complete it here. So I'm, that's why I'm, I'm doing a completely extempore uh, speech here. Presidential law in India, we must understand the source of it. As far as the Supreme Court is concerned, it is Article 141, where the Constitution says that the law laid down by the Supreme Court will be binding on all courts and tribunals and authorities throughout the country. Constitutionally, presidential law, therefore, laid down by the Supreme Court becomes the law of the country. It's applicable in terms of Section 141. Of course, we have seen recently 142 getting in in tax law, never, never earlier. 142 is an inherent right of the court to do substantial justice. That justice is not in justifying notices, lacks of notices issued illegally. Unfortunately, that 142 has come in, but the source of presidential law in India is Article 141. In fact, very early, very early in, in the life of this country, when Bengal immunity was decided, Supreme Court said that when we speak about all courts, that does not include su Supreme Court, saying pretty much to say that the Supreme Court is not bound by its own decisions. Of course, today, the well-settled position is that even the Supreme Court is bound by its own decision. And a larger bench will bind a smaller bench of the Supreme Court. As far as the High Courts are concerned, there is no similar provision like 141. Then how do we say that High Court decisions are binding? One source of that power seems to be under Article 227 of the Constitution, which makes the High Courts in a particular territorial jurisdiction in charge of superintendence of all courts, tribunals and authorities. That gives the power to the High Court to make the law binding. Because if it has superintendence, the authorities which are lower, or the tribunals or courts which are lower, have to necessarily follow, otherwise the High Court will itself implement it. Three, very early again, in 1962, East India Commercial is a decision of the Supreme Court, which says that the highest court of the, of the state, which is the High Court, its decisions are, have to be unreservedly followed by the courts and tribunals in the country. It went on to say, and this is something which people don't use, and I am I'm, I'm going to state this specifically, that in East India commercial, if one reads it carefully, the Supreme Court says that if proceedings are launched contrary to binding decisions of the High Court in a state, then it gives a right to the court to issue a writ of certiorari. That means the proceedings can be actually quashed if your proceedings are directly contrary to the law laid down by a high court, which is binding, or by the Supreme Court. Very important decision which we seem to forget because oftentimes the question arises that should we or should we not approach a writ court in a particular case? In income tax, of course, the writ jurisdiction is actually entertained far more than in indirect taxes. In 148, we know that a writ as a matter of right, right from Calcutta discount onwards, the courts have said that it's a jurisdictional issue and therefore we will entertain this. In indirect taxes, showcause notices are normally not inter interfered with. But we've been successful in often times to interdict a completely illegal and arbitrary proceeding where direct judgments of the Supreme Court and the High Courts have been violated. Therefore, the source of the power is important and we can approach High Courts in these situations where High Court decisions are not being followed. Then let's look at the tribunals. The tribunals are of course bound by the decisions of High Courts and the Supreme Court. They are also bound by their own decisions. And sometimes the issue arises that if there is a tribunal decision 
and there is no jurisdictional high court decision, what does the tribunal do? In that situation, the law is again clear that even if there is a non-jurisdictional high court, tribunal will have to follow it. If there is a tribunal decision which is contrary to the non-jurisdictional uh, high court decision, non-jurisdictional high court should be preferred over the tribunal decision, again because of hierarchy of courts. Third issue is, Supreme Court itself says that if the tribunal ignores a binding decision of the Supreme Court, it even arises, that's an income tax decision in uh, Honda CL products, saying that it gives rise to a rectifiable error under 254.2 of the Income Tax Act. That is the importance of presidential law, to say that if the tribunal has ignored a binding decision, it becomes an error apparent from record. Third issue here is, what happens if there is a jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional high court? Answer is clear, jurisdictional high court is to be followed. If we create a slight difference in facts to create an interesting situation, Supposing the assessing authority is in Rajasthan and the tribunal is in Delhi. You have a Delhi High Court favorable and a Rajasthan High Court unfavorable. What does the tribunal do? What is the jurisdiction? Normally, in an appeal, High Court is defined to mean where the original authority is seated. Original authority is bound by Rajasthan. Tribunal is seated in Delhi. Tribunal is bound by Delhi. What should be done? I think Delhi. And if there is a conflict, and, and I'll tell you why I say Delhi. It's not just Delhi or Rajasthan. Actually, the way the courts have resolved it, that sometimes even Supreme Court decisions are conflicting and they are of equal number. What should be done? There are at least three decisions which mention that in such a situation, earlier uh, line of cases was that a later decision should be followed. Second line of cases is that if the later decision has not noticed the earlier decision, Later decision becomes per incurium and therefore the earlier should be followed. The last view, and this is the most interesting view, is that when you are conflicted with two Supreme Court decisions taking contrary stand and they are of strength of equal number, then, no, the tribunal can't refer it to a larger. The tribunal can't refer it. We are talking about what does the tribunal do and what does, an, what does a practitioner do in that kind of a situation. In this situation, Supreme Court has said that the forum which is deciding the appeal should pick up the better view. Yes. Then discretion again. Discretion again. <laughs> independent, independent view. It will be decided by the court. And. Mm -hmm. and decided in case this case. Correct. Yes. Correct. Uh -huh. And in that, let's bring in another mix. Mm -hmm. One decision against the SSC, one decision in favor of the SSC. But unfortunately, both are jurisdiction, jurisdictional in some sense. Then I will argue CIT versus vegetable products. Favorable view to the SSC should be followed. So, that is in a different context. Context different. But when we create context like this, new presidential law is developed. Yes, yes. Right? So these are, these, and this is the ingenuity of the mind of a lawyer. Yes. How to create and how to use the precedent in your favor. Because oftentimes precedents are sidelined, and when we see the orders passed by lower authorities, we see a completely pedestrian, oftentimes, very sorry to say, completely pedestrian way of distinguishing judgments. You have 25 judgments 
साइड कर दिए नॉट एप्लीकेबल इन द फैक्ट ऑफ द केस दैट्स द स्टैंडर्ड वे ऑफ डूइंग इट नॉट एप्लीकेबल इन द फैक्ट ऑफ द केस क्यों कैसे नथिंग नाउ नॉर्मली देफोर ऑल कोर्ट डिसीजन हाई कोर्ट डिसीजन ट्राइब्यूनल डिसीजन और बाइंडिंग ऑन पीपल Ordinarily, I would think even decisions of authorities should be binding. And I'm talking about, you know, uh, I don't want to, I don't have a case to cite, but I'm talking about experience when I initially joined the Supreme Court practice. This is Barucha used to head the tax court usually, and there were situations which came up which said. that this assessing authority has taken a decision in favor the next assessing authority has taken a decision against the department itself is not following its own decisions argument from the department side came to say that these are not precedents i'm free to take whatever decision i can take he shot down that argument In fact, there is a judgment in Steel Authority's case. I think it's 112 VLT or something, which is uh, reported, where a question of trade notices came in. Trade notices are issued by commissionerates. They are not issued by the board, and therefore they are not binding in that sense on all departmental officers. The logic that Justice Barucha gave in that judgment of Steel Authority was that. it's not a question of statutory law making circulars binding it's a question of certainty and if one arm of the of the government one commissioner has gone out and issued